Or what about uh, the evolutionists? What do they say? What do they teach? Well, what I want to do is to go back to the 1950s. Why? Because I was an atheist in the 1950s. And I used to argue with Christians about their God and about the Bible. And I used to point out that the scientists had discovered the continuous evolution of the universe, that there was no beginning to the universe, there would be no end to the universe, and that it was always the same. Christians could, did, well, in fact, all the Christians I spoke to did not have any arguments. They, I, I used to say to them, how can you possibly believe in a book which starts off in the beginning when the evolutionists have, and the scientists have shown there was no beginning? Uh, oh, um, uh, and they used to walk away from me. No wonder I was an atheist. I didn't, I didn't meet people who got answers to the questions that I had until I got to university and then I met somebody who got all the answers. Well, what about now? Well, they believe the Big Bang. You think about it for a moment. What does the Big Bang teach? It teaches in the beginning, nothing exploded. You know the difference between creation and evolution? In the beginning, God created. In the beginning, nothing exploded. I find that evolutionists don't like me saying that. I had one evolutionist come to me at the end of a meeting and he said, how dare you say such a thing? How dare you mock what we believe? And I said, all right, what do you believe? I said, do you believe in the beginning? He said, yes. I said, do you believe there was nothing? He said, yes. I said, do you believe that nothing exploded? He said, yes. He said, what's the problem? <laughs> and this, uh, this nothing is supposed to give rise to the universe. With all the stars, with all these galaxies. With all these galaxies that we can see on this illustration here. And the question is, you know, how many stars are there in the universe? What I want to try to do is just to give you an idea. Because we're told that there are 100,000 million galaxies. And each of these galaxies contain 100,000 million stars. And if you multiply those two numbers together, you get that number. And the question of Darwinism is to show that there is no need for a supernatural creator because nature can do the creating by itself. And if that's the case, and if that's the case, of course, there's no God. And nothing exploded. And the Big Bang Theory relies on a growing number of hypothetical entities. We've heard this in this conference of the problems about the Big Bang. Things that they've never observed. Now, let's get back to this. This, this, is, this is something I, I, I find is, is, is uh, uh, worth, worth thinking about. You know, if you believe everything comes from nothing, you believe that nothing without mind created reason and uh, uh, logic. Nothing without intelligence created understanding and comprehension. Nothing without morals created complex ethical codes and legal systems. Nothing without conscience created a sense of right and wrong. Nothing without emotion created art, music, drama, comedy, literature and dance. And you know, you read in books about the Big Bang, our universe probably came into existence not only from nothing, but from nowhere. You know, and if you teach kids this, and if you drip, 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 you know, with the dinosaurs, when you start at the age of whatever it is, you go to school here, and in Wales you start to go to school when you're four, and England it's five, uh, and you start to tell them, no one's ever seen a dinosaur, dinosaurs have evolved, humans have evolved, and drip, 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 evolution, what happens? No wonder teenagers haven't a clue where they come from. They haven't a clue where they're going. They've got no idea what they're on this planet Earth for. They're just one cosmic accident and how depressed they are and one can understand it. See, according to the evolutionist, millions of years of death, millions of years of bloodshed, millions of years of suffering and disease have given rise to man's existence. And that's why if you go to this graveyard, you'll see the graves of some of my ancestors. This is in Broad Hembury in Devon, St. Andrew's parish church that is where the famous Augustus Montague top lady preached yeah, that's where he was vicar and in case you don't know who top lady is he's the uh, man who wrote rock of ages Carl Whelan Dr. Carl Whelan CEO of uh, answers in Genesis in the US, in Australia said if Darwin was right there is no ultimate meaning or purpose to life except what we choose you are born you suffer you die that's it Perhaps if you're lucky, you get recycled as organic manure. But beyond that, you're just a number that happens to come up in the great casino of the universe. And some people, they wanted to marry evolution with creation. They say, what, why, why do you spend your time just arguing about this all the time, Monty, and going out and uh, uh, talking about this? 
Well, you know, this is the implication. If, if, if you can marry uh, evolution with what the Bible teaches, how on earth can God say it's very good if you've had millions of years of death in the past? Who is Adam according to the evolutionists? What is sin according to the evolutionists? Where's the Garden of Eden to the evolutionists? You see, you cannot marry the two. If you try to marry the two, guess which one gets modified? You know the answer to this. It's always the Bible. It's always Genesis in particular that gets modified. What does the Bible teach about the origin of death? It teaches this. For as in Adam all die. This is the bad news of this particular verse. Because of Adam's sin, we have death. That's why my ancestors were buried in that church where Top Lady was uh, the vicar. You see, this is what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that in the past there was no death and God uh, said that it was very good. Then Adam died and we've got death in the present. But there's going to be a time when there's going to be no more death. You can call it the death of death in the death of Christ. This is what John Knox called it. He said, that's when death died, it died on Calvary. Not only did Jesus Christ conquer sin, uh, or pay the price of sin on Calvary's cross, but he also conquered death. So the good news is, for Adam and Adam all die, well that's the bad news, the good news is, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Do you know it was that verse that convicted me uh, to start to believe in Genesis. It's strange that I would say evolution is religion. It is a religion. Evolution is a religion. This is taken from Michael Ruse's uh, article. And he says, evolution is promoted by its practitioners as more than mere science. Evolution is promulgated as an ideology, a secular religion, a fully-fledged alternative to Christianity with meaning and morality. Evolution is a religion. This was true of evolution in the beginning, and it is true of evolution still today. You see, evolution equals atheism equals no purpose. Let me summarize my views on what modern evolutionary tells us loud and clear. This is Professor William Brovine. He says, there are no gods, no purposes, no goal-directed forces of any kind. There is no life after death. When I die, am I absolutely certain that I am going to be dead. That's the end for me. There is no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning to life, and no free will for humans either. Bill Jack said, whenever anybody says that to us, we should say to them, what if you're wrong? What will happen to you when you die? You see, we can have life in the cross. It is better to put your trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Not my 